안녕하십니까 니콜라스 입니다 여러분 새해 복 많이 받으세요 On this video we are going to talk about a programming language that I believe every developer should try at least once and that is Rust Rust has been voted as the most loved programming language for six years in a row in the Stack Overflow developer survey Even though it is a fairly young language compared to C and C++ companies like Amazon, Cloudflare and Microsoft are replacing C and C++ with Rust Microsoft, for example, has been rewriting low-level Windows components in Rust that used to be in C and C++. And Google is sponsoring the project that is trying to bring Rust as the second official programming language of the Linux kernel, which right now is based only in C. Even Intel is investing in working with Rust with the Intel principal engineer calling Rust as the future of systems programming and calling C as the new assembly. Assembly being a language that nobody actually writes on anymore. It also turns out that Rust is eco-friendly as well. Rust and C are both 50% more energy efficient than Java and they are 98% more energy efficient than Python. But it also turns out that Rust code is more secure than C and C++ code. Microsoft says that if they use Rust instead of C and C++, they would have had 70% less security vulnerabilities. That is a lot. Rust also has a very good developer experience and that is thanks to the compiler. It has the most helpful compiler I have ever worked with, for sure. The compiler of Rust tells you that the code is wrong, but also it explains to you why it's wrong. It also tells you how you can fix it and even sometimes will give you the code to fix the problem. It's amazing. If all I have said today has made you curious to learn more about Rust, then please keep watching because today we are going to see what makes Rust different from other programming languages, what makes it so special, what makes it as fast as C, but safer than C, what does safety even mean in the programming world, what can you build with Rust, who should learn Rust, and we're going to be looking at the code and compiler as well. Rust is a low-level programming language that is focused on being fast and safe. Let's just start by looking at what low level means. We say that low level programming languages are closer to the machine. And we say that high level programming languages are closer to developers, to the way humans speak. From low to high, the closest you can get to the machine would be to write zeros and ones. But nobody does that, so instead we have assembly code. Assembly code is literal instructions to the processor. But again, nobody does that also, so we have something a little bit higher than that, and that is C and C++. Then maybe Java would come, and then at the top would be JavaScript and Python, for example. What makes a language low or high level is how many layers of abstraction there are between the code that the developer writes and the zeros and ones that the machine understands. If you look at JavaScript in the browser, for example, it is not a compiled language, and there is many abstraction levels between JavaScript code and zeros and ones because JavaScript has to be understood and read by the browser. The browser is programmed maybe on C and C++. So the browser reads your code, the browser will execute your code, and then the browser will tell the processor what to do. So as you can see, there are many steps between the machine and the code that you wrote. It's the same with Python. The interpreter of Python is written in C. So when you write Python code and you run the code, what you are doing is you are giving your Python code to a C program and that C program is understanding what you want to do and that C program is then talking to the processor to do what you want to do. In contrast, low level languages like C or Rust don't need this translation. They don't need this middleman. Because when you finish working with Rust or C, when you compile that code, the code that you will get, the code that you will run, will be understood by the processor directly. This means there is no middleman between your code and the computer. As you can imagine, because we are closer to the machine and because the code that we wrote does not need a middleman to be understood by the processor, our programs are going to run faster. That also means that our code is going to be more powerful. We are closer to the machine. We are right next to the machine so that we can do whatever we want. But that means we also have to be more careful. Like Uncle Ben says, with great power comes great responsibility. In low-level languages like C, for example, you have to manage memory by yourself. Which means that, for example, if you want to create a variable to save a string of text, you're going to have to ask for a space in memory to be able to put your variable there. And when you are done doing whatever you need to do with that variable, you also have to remember to free that space in memory. If you just take space in memory and you forget to free the memory, then your program will run out of memory and crash. If you come from a language like Python or JavaScript, I am sure that this concept feels very, very foreign to you. In JavaScript or Python, when we are using variables, we just create variables. We don't have to ask for a space in memory, please. We just have to just 
create the variable. And when we are done using the variable, we just don't do anything with the variable. We don't have to remember to also free that memory space. Now, this is not because Python and JavaScript are magical and they never run out of memory. The reason why they don't run out of memory is because there is a magical little guy called the garbage collector in the background doing all this memory management for us. The garbage collector is a program that is looking at your program while it's running. It is looking at the variables that you create and is looking to see which variables you don't use anymore. If nothing is pointing to a variable, that means that that variable is garbage, so it will be freed from memory. When a programming language has a garbage collector, it will be very comfortable for developers to write code in that language because we don't have to think about allocating and freeing memory all the time. But, but because of the garbage collector, our program is not going to run as fast as if it was written in a programming language like C that does not have garbage collection. Now, garbage collection was one of the reasons why Discord switched from Go to Rust. Go has a garbage collector while Rust doesn't. And in the case of Discord, they saw some performance spikes happen because of the garbage collector. C and Rust do not have garbage collectors, which makes them faster. But that also means that developers have to be careful when they're accessing memory. Microsoft says that 70% of the security issues that they have to fix are related to memory access. Memory access bugs can happen when, for example, we access a place in memory that doesn't exist. It hasn't been allocated. Or when we're trying to access a part of memory that has already been freed. Or when we free a part of memory twice. All these are mistakes that are very easy to make and they will result in a runtime error. This is when Rust shines, and this is why companies like Rust so much. Because it maybe it's not faster than C, maybe it's not faster than C++, but it is safer than them, providing almost the same performance, which is a huge win. In Rust, we don't have garbage collection, but we also don't have to allocate and free memory manually. And that's because Rust has a very cool way of thinking about memory, and it's a concept called ownership. Ownership is one, if not the most important concept to understand when working with Rust. It makes you think about the data in your program in a different way than what we are used to if you're using JavaScript, Python, Go, or even C. With the concept of ownership, the data of your program is owned by variables. Your data can only be owned by one owner at a time. And if the owner is not in scope or used anymore, the data is dropped from memory. If it sounds hard to understand, it's because it is. It's not a very easy concept to grasp at the beginning, especially if we're coming from a garbage collected language like Go, JavaScript, or Python. I won't explain ownership 100% on this video, but I do want to give you a taste of how ownership looks like. Here we have some Rust code with two functions. One is the main function where we are creating a variable called my name that holds the text Nico. The main function is then calling the say hi function and it's sending the my name as an argument. On the say hi function, we just print hi plus the name that we received. After everything is done in the say hi function, we return to the main function where we are printing the my name variable one more time. Now think for a second and tell me what do you think the output would be? We have a variable with a string. We give that variable to a function. The function is going to print that variable on the console. When that function is finished, then we're going to print that variable again in the console. If we are JavaScript, Python, or even Go developers, what we would expect would be to see something like this on the output. But in the Rust world, that would not be correct. That would not compile at all. This is because after we call the say hi function with the my name variable as an argument, the data, which is the string that contains Nico, is moved, not copied, but moved out of the my name variable into the say hi function. Now the say hi function is the owner of the Nico string and the my name variable in the main function cannot be used anymore. As you can see with ownership, we have to think about how the data moves in our program in a different way to what we are used to. And this is one of the reasons why learning Rust is not an easy task at all. It has a very steep learning curve, in my opinion. When I learned Go for the first time, I felt productive in Go in like a week or less. But I have been writing Rust code for a while now, and I cannot really say that I feel 100% comfortable with it. But thankfully, as I said, the Rust compiler is super cool and helpful. If you make a mistake, it is going to help you fix that mistake. It's going to teach you. It's even going to give you the code that you need. It's awesome. 
If we try to run the code with the ownership error, for example, it will give you a pretty good message of how the variable was created, where was it moved, and where you made a mistake. Or for example, if you are new to Rust and you want to just print a number in the console and you do the following code, that code is not going to work. But the error that you're going to see in the compiler is going to be very helpful. It is going to point out at the place where the error happened and it's also going to even give you a helpful message to tell you what code you might need. Awesome. So what can you build with Rust? Personally, I am using Rust to build smart contracts for blockchain platforms like Polkadot and Solana. But people are using Rust to build all sorts of things. You can use Rust to build command line interfaces. You could program your backend in Rust. There are people writing software for embedded devices in Rust. There's also people making video game engines in Rust. And you could even make a web application in Rust if you compile it to WebAssembly. But just because we can doesn't mean we should. It's always better to think about choosing the right tool for the job. So if you're looking for raw speed, safety and correctness, then I think Rust is a very, very good choice if you are already a developer and you have the time to learn it. But if instead of program speed, you are looking for developer speed, but you still want a language that is faster than Python and JavaScript, then I would say that Go is a very good choice. In Rust, the code runs fast. In Go, the programmer runs fast. If you are already a developer and you want to learn Go because you're curious, you want to see how fast the language can be, how simple can it be, and how easy can it be to learn, then please click the link below there. You're going to find a free Golang course with subtitles in Hangul Go. We're going to see what makes Go so special, what makes it faster than Python or JavaScript, and we're going to build a tiny project as well. So please click the link below and I will see you there. Now coming back to Rust, even if you don't have a use case right now for Rust, even if you don't have an idea of a CLI you want to make or you don't want to make a video game, you don't want to make a backend, you don't want to deal with blockchains and things, even if you have no use case for Rust right now, I would still recommend to learn Rust for at least a couple of weeks. Because I think that even then, even if you have no use case for Rust, it is going to make you a better developer. I mean, first of all, you are going to have access to a tool that is incredibly fast. And if you ever need to, you're going to be able to build incredibly fast software. But also, I think that learning Rust is going to make you a better developer outside of the Rust programming language. In my case, for example, after learning Rust and understanding the concept of ownership, I became a better developer outside of Rust. I think about my code in a more organized way. I think about data in a different way. And I find myself that even if I'm working in Go, or JavaScript that don't have any ownership rules, I find myself still following those rules. That even if the language doesn't enforce the rules, I pretend like they exist because it makes my code very easy to think about. It makes me think about the data flow of my applications in a very different and I would say more organized way. But that's just what I think. Let me know what you think. Are you going to try Rust? Uh, have you tried Rust already? Did you like it? Did you hate it? What are you building with Rust? What do you want to build with Rust? Let me know in the comments. I'm going to be looking at them right now. As always, thank you for watching this video. Stay happy, stay free, eat kimchi, kamsamnida, sarangheyo, and see you on the next one.